welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Another solo show this week, uh, and not for reasons of plague or disorganization for once, but uh, a bunch of reasons, I suppose. Uh, I guess partially because I couldn't find a guest to speak on this topic, but also maybe because I didn't want to inflict this topic on a guest. So uh, I'm sitting here behind my local oval in my new ute, like a real boy. And when I say new, it's extremely secondhand. Uh, It's new to me. And for Americans, a ute is a pickup. Uh, This is because in a kind of weird roundabout, or I don't know, rhyme with last year where I had six months of construction going on right outside the window of where I would record. I kind of have a similar thing happening at the moment uh, on the farm, except it's my fault because as of today, the uh, building and construction work for the guest accommodation has begun. So uh, yes, I took my dash cam. Actually, it's a Taz cam. Um, You'll notice the dash cam in the second car if you are um, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you know how I feel about driving videos. Like a little baby, they relax me. And, uh, and so I recorded one of them this morning, sort of heading south down the valley to a little town called Dover and then back up. And a couple of reasons, as I said, they relax me, but also a few people have asked for it. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you're seeing um, you know, video camera out the front of uh, the car going through the Huon Valley. Uh, this is a little tie-in to a recent post. If you have caught that, it came out yesterday. But um, generally, it's just because I kind of feel like I want to experiment where things like place and and what have you can be folded into the show. So if you've caught this on your podcatcher and you're like, do you know what? I actually just like dash cam videos as well. Hit stop, head over to YouTube and watch it there. If you don't like them, well, good luck. You can watch it on YouTube with your eyes closed. Uh, you can listen to the podcast elsewhere. It's all up to you. Now, what I want to talk about because I deliberately kept the title of this one a little vague, is Jordan Peterson. Now, reasons for that. He's a thing that is happening at this point in the timeline that touches so many of the kind of topics that we discuss here. So at some stage, we have to unpack him from a rune soup perspective. Now, in no way is this a sales pitch or even really a promotion uh, for, you know, him and his stuff and, and so on. But similarly, nor is it a sort of hysterical exorcism of a globally dangerous Nazi here to perpetuate genocide on trans people or whatever. And I guess the final reason for this topic uh, for a solo show is... It's possible. I have something of a unique perspective on how he is neither a genius nor Hitler. And so you know how his fans or a lot of his fans will say, he's like my dad. I wish he was my dad. And actually, even his detractors say all these people who follow him, all they really want is a dad. Well, he is actually my dad. (laughs) Uh, And this kind of came about when my parents were visiting the farm for the first time last month. Uh, So my father is a center-right mental health professional from the colonies who lectures internationally. So I literally have a Jordan Peterson at home. And uh, he hadn't, he was aware of him uh, because I asked, like, what do you think of Jordan Peterson? And he said, I'm aware of him. Uh, But he hadn't, you know, read any of his stuff uh, or watched any of his videos uh, you could tell he has never tidied a room in his goddamn life, right? So the genesis of the post came about from that visit. And I thought, well, this is a pretty good opportunity. So I I mean, Jordan Peterson was touring in the UK. It was nearly, you know, during the Kathy Newman incident and so on. So I found a, a recent video of him that I sent to my father after he left the farm 
uh, I think it was Jordan Peterson's presentation for his book uh, at Oxford, just to say, like, you know, give me your professional opinion on this stuff and I can kind of open it up from there. And he did graciously watch the video and come back. And he, he's broadly positive from a professional perspective about the things that Jordan Peterson talks about. Now, my father's a psychiatrist rather than a psychologist, so he's a little bit bigger, I guess, on the molecules, on the actual chemistry of the brain, for better and for worse, as listeners to this show know, right? So um, his immediate thoughts were there's some good science in there, but some of it kind of veers not quite to pseudoscience, but in, in order to make some of the discussion around neurotransmission, uh, I guess, palatable or available to a lay audience, uh, he kind of oversimplifies p potentially. So for instance, the uh, the serotonin as the neurotransmitter in the proverbial lobsters, he kind of pointed out that is true, but neurotransmission is a kind of chemical cascade effect. And I kind of said, slow down, egghead, and whatever. But I, I just really wanted him to look at it and see you know, um, get some professional eyes on it because there's a, there's a point with where I'm going with this, right? And uh, it's this. Uh, well, first of all, I actually want to put my kind of own, obviously non-psychiatric criticism into Jordan Peterson's sciencey medically approach. And it was good to hear that about the neurotransmission because it's sort of something I was dimly aware of. But it my bigger criticism is his over-reliance on evolutionary psychology, which if you're familiar with the blog and so on, you're kind of aware is a kind of like a rudgid Kipling just so story to go along with evolution. It's sort of looking at one definitely not correct yet thesis, which is evolution, and then looking at certain behaviors that humans in particular have and then kind of making up where some of those behaviors may come from based on this evolutionary model. And uh, that's obviously hugely problematic because you kind of, it's almost a two wrongs attempting to make a right, but very often it's quite silly. Uh, and, and I say very often because if we can get vitalism, frankly, but if we can get vi vitalism and agency back into our understanding of evolution slash the kind of point of living systems, then there is probably a lot that can emerge from an evo-psych perspective from that. So it kind of really requires evolution to be improved or haunted, if you will. But uh, I guess the real reason... Well, what I wanted to speak to my father about, because well, he's retired now, but he's had very different levels of... Uh, he's provided very different levels of treatment from an intensity perspective. So he's run drug and alcohol outpatient groups. He's been a classical therapist. He he can even he never uses it, but he's a trained you know hypnotist or hypnotherapist and all that kind of stuff. So he's gone from your kind of classic psychiatric one on one. He runs outpatient groups. Uh, he's done work for insurance companies and, and assessing stress claims and so on. So I wanted to talk to him about what I saw, and I was kind of grateful that Jordan Peterson mentioned it in his most recent Rogan interview. He said what he's doing is minimum intervention. And that's what I wanted to get from Dad. I'm like, is this, is this what he's doing? Because that's what I think it is, and kind of my whole argument or opinion about him hinges on that. And I said, yes, this is generally minimum intervention. And that's the kind of classic tidy your room, uh, right? Now, overeducated people who are now, and I think fucking wrongly, calling fans of Jordan Peterson stupid uh, are also stupid because they're assuming it's a philosophy. So they're saying Jordan Peterson has a stupid philosophy. Well, yeah, because it's not a fucking philosophy. <laughs> it's a, a collection of minimum intervention techniques to improve someone's life. So if you're dumb enough to think it is a philosophy, then maybe you are stupid. But let me tell you something else. I mean, if you are wondering why your dull academic treatise never quite took off on YouTube the way Jordan Peterson's material does, maybe it's because you're calling people stupid, dum-dum. 
So uh, let's not for a second pretend that a huge amount, a huge amount of, shall we say, his professional criticism is coming from people who are jealous of the attention and very obviously the Patreon money as well. So I find that kind of stuff sneering and disgusting for an extra reason too. Well, a, a bunch of them. But you're calling people who need mental health treatment stupid. So stay classy on that, right? Now, what is minimum intervention then, I guess, is probably the the <laughs> the next step after I got that rant out of my system. And minimum intervention, think of it like this. I believe I mentioned this in the Chaos Protocols. It was something that Ferrari worked out when they were building a new supercar and they were looking at how they allocate, allocated their R&D budget over the course of building a new car. And it turns out that... 50% of your R&D budget will get your new car 90% to completion. And the other 50% will get it that last 10% across the line. Now, minimum intervention doesn't quite have the same numbers, right? But there is still a huge, huge jump in psychological or mental health outcomes from doing some of these fairly simplistic techniques. That's why it's called minimum intervention. Cleaning your room, right? Now, if you've ever been in the throes of a depressive episode, and I have, not for a while, uh, inshallah, uh, you will actually know how fucking hard, to the point of near impossible, it is to clean, to tidy your room. Uh, and how much of an achievement it is when that's complete. And so I frankly, again, coming back to it, I find the academics shitting on him from a great height as somehow any, like that he's giving people crap philosophy or he's a new Deepak Chopra. Uh, I actually find it cruel. Uh, and not so much to him, I assume he can take it, but to me and, and maybe some of you, I think, that is, I think that is a really cruel position to take with some ideas that maybe you don't agree of. But tidying your room, getting some light exercise outdoors, eating fewer carbs, that genuinely removes, and this is why I wanted to speak to my father about it, for instance, that genuinely removes the need for uh, medication in terms of treating depression for maybe 60% of people. That's, you know, to, to use a Jordan Peterson-ism, that's not nothing. Uh, and I want to talk about his, obviously we'll get to it. I'm just looking at my notes here. We will get to critiquing his, I guess, ideology or conception of the world eventually. But the first thing I want to do, because it did, I'm just kind of trying to go off my memory here. Uh, and my father is visiting the farm about a week after the Kathy Newman thing. So let's start with that. <laughs> What Kathy Newman was doing is not feminism, right? Uh, I heard her tone of voice, and it, I've met a couple of dozen Kathys. It is not SJW or any of that crap. It's not feminism. It's London. That is the view from and the voice of London. Her voice genuinely sounds like background noise at Soho House to me. If you've ever been around BBC people uh, or people who wish they were BBC, uh, such as in her case, it's not her gender uh, and her... Yeah, let's just say that. It's not her gender. It's not the fact that Kathy Newman is a woman. It's not social justice. It is grosser. Uh, when I hear it, I don't hear, you know, feminism with scary quotation marks. I hear that arrogant, condescending London media voice that was just nails on chalkboard for eight years. And she's certainly, I mean, she was certainly justifiably and completely trounced. But if you watch that and you react negatively, be sure to react negatively to the right thing, which is that urban London view of the world. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's that kind of London centrist, bleh, right? So I just wanted to get the Kathy Newman bit out of the way in case you're all 
you know, listening and waiting for the opinion on it. Um, she's clearly in the wrong, but her wrongness is not feminism or any of that stuff. It's more annoying. It's London. It's, it's in her vocal cords. But we should look now that that's done at his worldview and critique what I think are its inconsistencies. Because they are inconsistent. But um, in a way, this gets back to people, to detractors, which from a worldview perspective, I certainly am. It gets back to assuming what is minimum intervention techniques being made publicly available as some form of philosophy. I went looking. I can't find any worthwhile articles criticizing him from a professional perspective from people who actually read that big giant book he wrote in the late 90s or whatever, that Maps of Meaning book. Not the, the 12 Rules one that just came out. Um, usually people have watched a few videos and uh, and then decided what it is that Jordan Peterson is saying and critiqued that. Now, I haven't read Maps of Meaning either, and I'm not going to. So that means we are projecting me right now, and you if you haven't read it, which I'm going to guess is all of you, uh, we are projecting what we assume his worldview is onto public demonstration of minimum intervention approaches and his paranoia about communism. So we're, we're, we are building an artifice here, and that's just how it is. But as far as I can tell, his worldview appears to be Classical liberalism plus a mid to late 20th century Jungianism, all of which have their good and bad points. So classical liberalism is good in its efforts to keep state in particular or author authoritarian control out of your life as much as possible. And you see that in his public reactions to Canada's silly laws that kind of kick-started this whole thing, right? But the kick in the tail of classical liberalism that no one really notices is that you reject external authoritarianism, fine, but the other half of it is you impose it upon yourself. So you become, in a way, you become an authoritarian state of one. It has that kind of Protestant suspicion of pleasure and focus on hard work and individual achievement and rigor. So you kick the state out and then you become it. And you can see how, if you understand the context in which it emerged and how it kind of grew in the new world, um, you get that. It is, it's a very dour kind of pioneering <laughs> uh, worldview. It's good in the sense of, you know, not of being suspicious of authority and, and that kind of stuff. But I think a lot of Jordan Peterson's, what I perceive to be, and I think correctly, sex negativity and suspicion of pleasure comes from this. This, for instance, it, for instance, his outdated views on monogamy or the possibility, he's, I've, I've seen him say this three or four times, that basically if your spouse cheats on you, you'll go actually insane. And... <clears throat> Obviously, I don't think, well, I actually don't know that many monogamous people anymore. But, and they all appear to be at least as sane as me, definitely not saying much. In many ways, I'm not sure that classical liberal suspicion of pleasure or the internal adoption of authoritarianism is, I, I think it sits uneasily. With Jung's charge, because we're getting to the Jungian part of his worldview, to make the unconscious conscious. And you'll notice if you've read the blog post, um, St. Augustine and the Parrot, that I deliberately put that one out before doing this solo show so you can kind of get a bit more context around that idea. But basically, becoming fully aware of complexes, which is how things like archetypes do in fact manifest within that Jungian cosmology, right? especially when so many of them have to do with sex, requires a healthier attitude to pleasure and physical sexual experience than his kind of Lucy and Ricky Ricardo view of marriage, right? So I think there's uh, shortcomings in classical liberalism, and I don't think the classical liberalism 
connects the way he wants it to with a kind of Jungian cosmology. So it's it's inconsistent from a belief system perspective. So this is kind of what I mean. When you know, I get asked all the time, he said this, what do you think of this, and so on. I look at it and go, I don't think I don't think he's put as much analysis into his thoughts uh, as may, or, or into the coherence of his thoughts as maybe he thinks he has, because these sort of fall down there, right? Which brings us <clears throat> inevitably to postmodernism. Now, this is a chaos magic blog and podcast, so he and I are probably going to depart on this, right? Now. To quote Kwai Gon Jin, because see above, chaos magic, your focus determines your reality. Peterson would agree with this, I imagine. Probably wouldn't quote a Star War, but uh, maybe he would. Now, if you spend 30 years studying the atrocities of totalitarian regimes, and a lot of the criticism that he surfaces of these is very valid, maybe even all of it. But you will you will see that everywhere. If you look at gulags and if you look at concentration camp guards for 30 years, especially during the Cold War, you will see them everywhere. So I think some of his if-this-then-that logical conclusions about the return of totalitarianism come from that, come from him jumping at, I don't want to say jumping at shadows because the crimes that he tells people about, the gulags and so on, it's great that people are reading Solzhenitsyn, whatever, um, all true. I just think there's a, there's a logical error in the if then that to it. And part of that is this whole postmodern shtick. Uh, and if you know the postmodern canon, you'll know this already. It's something of a straw man. If you bundle a 40-year project together with the Frankfurt School, and we'll come back to that, all into the one thing, you can kind of cherry-pick up and down this sort of timeline or what is now a schmooshed-up ball of postmodernism and kind of pull out the bits that you don't like to make your case. A lot of the bits he pulls out are valid. A lot of it's crap. Uh, I, and But the thing is... A lot of that crapness has been interrogated by the postmodernist himself, and he doesn't, I have not once seen him kind of say that. So I don't much care for Derrida or Sartre I, at all. I, you know, I've read them. I haven't read all of Sartre um, because I don't really care for it. Uh, so a lot of those criticisms are correct. And in terms of Foucault, which I think he probably brings up the most, if not Sartre, it's either Sartre or Foucault. I do, in fact, like Foucault. Now, he, Michel Foucault, this is, clearly did um, overemphasize the role of power in the production of culture and identity. But to use another, but that doesn't mean that power is irrelevant to how culture, quote unquote, works or how you form as a human. It doesn't, so he overemphasized it. There are good historical reasons to it, but it kind of, I want to say back to Jordan Peterson, power is not nothing, because he says that's not nothing fairly often, right? And the thing is, it really did need to be interrogated, particularly in the post-war era, where you get postmodernism. I mean, just look at the dramatic changes that had happened to Western civilization and different manifestations of authoritarianism and, and so on. Like, it, people needed to look at how power shapes culture, right? But the idea that that it's some sort of, that this process is some sort of far-left assault on cultural values doesn't, work, especially doesn't work in Foucault's case, because half the time, <laughs> half the time he was accused of being in the opposite direction, maybe not half the time, but occasionally. If you've seen the kind of famous debate Foucault had with Noam Chomsky, for instance, Noam Chomsky, as he always does, gives you that sort of 105 IQ version of a classical left position. Um, nice guy by all accounts, but if you ever want to know what like a 105 IQ boring uh, 
dumb, dumb classical left position is Noam Chomsky is your guy. And Foucault is kind of bouncing all over the place with him, left and right and left and right. And I'm not sure that you can kind of say that that's a Marxist assault on on culture. Uh, Kate, I mean, they were banned. That's the other thing, um, which we'll come to in a second. Like this idea that there's a kind of mix. I just get, I need to tell you the um, Frankfurt School stuff first because, in that respect, he's right. But postmodernism as a critique of not just culture but power meant it was banned <laughs> by actual Marxists. So it's kind of a weird thing to sort of smush together. So obviously chaos magic owes a lot to postmodernism. Let's just draw a line under this bit, right? So I guess the official position, um, as far as I understand and use and think with postmodernism, is that it was a probably necessary phase of academic exploration. And it will, for us, clearly, it will be permanently incomplete because, as with the rest of these different 20th and even 21st century schools, minus a few notable exceptions, it emerges from non-magical perspectives. It emerges from materialism. So it's going to be incomplete. Uh, it was and is, uh, even, with you, even with Deleuze towards the end, I would say stringently materialist. And but much like the critique of power, even its materialism is historically contextualized or is contextually relevant historically. Because after the war... These guys were all looking at ways to distance themselves from that sort of Nazi-smelling transcendentalism of the previous century. So you can't just sort of whimsically wander back into transcendentalism or even phenomenology or any of this stuff after the war because the other guys did that and it destroyed Europe. So even that is... I don't... It's a valid criticism, but I don't think it can be built into his kind of bundling up of all of these things. And that bundle, I mean, <laughs> now we get to talk about my favorite stuff. So he's got that sort of neo-Marxist conspiracy theory that he's concocted. And you know how I roll when it comes to conspiracy theories, right? I've never met one I didn't like. What, you know, UFO encounters are to Jacques Vallée conspiracy theories are to me. I hoover them all up, uh, even the ones that are entirely wrong, which is most of them. Flat Earth, Russiagate, spiders from Saturn, bring it on. Because much like UFO encounters, they say something hugely interesting in aggregate um, about culture at, at this point in the timeline. And I don't think that's a contentious statement, right? But this one does not impress my inner shark tank panel. So it's a no from me. And as far as I can tell, the neo-Marxist conspiracy theory that has so alarmed Jordan Peterson goes like this, that it is the last gasp of Leninism sending over Marxist professors to infect Western civilization by relativizing all truths seizing control of speech using the protection of minor minorities as a cover and thus turning the whole world socialist. And this is because the Marxists couldn't get the proletariat or whatever <clears throat> to organize around labor participation, which is actually true. That's one of the things that he brought up. You, you had senior members, members of the sort of Soviet party would quickly come to hate <laughs> the proletariat because nobody cared. They didn't care about these ideas and glorious, you know, revolution and, and all that kind of, frankly, bourgeois stuff. They had families. They wanted a job. They wanted food. So in that sense, that bit is, in fact, true. Uh, but the Jordan Peterson cosmology has that the plan is now to get the masses to organize around that sort of identitarianism. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing. I wrote in that post I just mentioned, that St. Augustine in the Parrot Post, identitarianism isn't radical leftist. Uh, and you'll, you'll find a link to a sort of Zizek post about that. But as he points out, it is at best 
left liberalism, but it's still liberalism. So it's still Jordan Peterson, right? At worst, it is a deliberate scuppering of any authentic left critiques, especially the class-based ones, which you, you, you aren't doing left without class analysis. Whether you are left or not, that is just how it works. And so at worst, this is Zizek's point, right? So at worst, it might be a deliberate scuppering of these techniques by sort of swamping them under a tsunami of accusations of racism and sexism and ableism or anything else that prevents valid critique of the neoliberal project that we are all still ensconced in. And, uh, and in that kind of cryptic Zizek way, uh, cryptic or Bugs Bunny-ish, um, he says that if he was going to believe in a conspiracy theory, it would be that this whole identitarian thing is deliberately built and promulgated specifically to do that, specifically to swamp authentic left critiques of the system that we are stuck in. Now, that may not be the case in aggregate or in total across the whole sort of rise and rise of identitarianism. That may not be the case at all. Um, but it might be the case, I guess, in individual pieces. So it might be the case, for instance, in a recent election, because I feel like that does more or less precisely describe the ultimately unsuccessful tactics that Clinton took. First, to keep Bernie um, out of, you know, getting the candidacy, and then in the actual election. And so any critique of the neoliberal project that she stood for, that slightly different flavor of it, uh, was deemed, or any critique of Democrat policies was deemed as be labeled as being sexist. But anyway, back to Peterson's conspiracy theory. Um, look, <laughs> certainly academia is riddled with many dangerous ideas and mind viruses. But this one, like, so this sort of identitarian uh, flowering um, or bloom, algal bloom. Uh, I actually, and I, I wrote this in that post, I kind of think it's ending. Um, but the two that aren't, and I think are more urgent for us to critique, are obviously materialism but also that lack of skin in the game per Nassim Taleb. Now, that identitarian stuff is downstream from both of that, from materialism and lack of skin in the game. So if you, in fact, do... If, if you find it objectionable, and I, I've literally not met someone who hasn't found identitarianism objectionable, then you've got to head up <laughs> upstream and, uh, and kind of interrogate those two other pieces, right? But... Um, I think that's valid, and I think we can do that from – I actually don't know where we do that from. This is kind of part of the Big Table Animism project, right, because all those sort of flow-on ideas, um, not just identitarianism, but, you know, even authentic left discourse, most anarchist discourse, most libertarian discourse, all kind of come from this foundational idea. So if you're looking to – live in a world that has better interactions, you know, idea interactions, materialism, lack of skin in the game, that's where we need to go. But the extra dumb thing about the Peterson conspiracy theory, the neo-Marxist one, is that there really is a conspiracy here. Because, <laughs> you know, it's me, and so you're about to hear about it. So it's not with the postmodernism with the postmodernists, again, as Zizek points out, they were banned by Marxists, right? So it seems like an unusual, unless it's rather than a double agent, it's a triple agent. If that's the case, definitely don't take your daughter's Azizis or you'll get, I don't know, gassed by Putin. But um, there is a conspiracy theory with the Frankfurt School. Uh, and that the Frankfurt School Peterson lumps in with postmodernists for some good reasons, but mostly polemical ones. And there's actually a recent episode of Connor's podcast, Against Everyone with Connor Habib, where Thaddeus Russell will 
talk you through some of the clear totalitarianism that's there in the Frankfurt School and Adorno and so on. So the stuff that, if you're unfamiliar with the postmodernist canon, the stuff that Jordan Peterson is saying about postmodernism is not quite correct there, but is basically 100% correct when talking about the Frankfurt School. And uh, they really were unrepentant communists, uh, except that's not, that's not the actual conspiracy. If you read the blog, uh, or maybe you know this yourself, you will know that London and Wall Street, for instance, funded the Bolsheviks for the first couple of decades. That's proven. That's on record, right? It's currently unproven, but seems likely given that that was the case, that Quigley's Anglo-Americans also um, funded Marx, for instance. And there's Lenin's highly suspicious sealed train ride back to Russia. Now, these have all the hallmarks of that tragedy and hope model. Uh, and again, part of it is proven, the funding of the Bolsheviks in their first couple of decades, and then the rest of it is circumstantial but seems likely. Here's where we get to proven again. So get this. Who brought the Frankfurt School to America? Wild Bill Donovan. So that is the same OSS super spy, so forerunner of the CAA, um, who would train Mao's guerrillas. He'd go on to train Chairman Mao, well, not yet Chairman, Mao's guerrillas in China at a time when, of course, the official American position was obviously anti-communist. Now, what is a CIA or proto-CIA super spy doing bringing unrepentant communists in to teach at American universities? When you see Wild Bill pop up anywhere in the story, what you are looking at is one of the principal bagmen for Quigley's Anglo-Americans. So if he's there, it's part of that project. The official position of why Wild Bill brought the beginnings of the Frankfurt School over to America was to help America understand Nazism. Um, my sweet summer children, at least half of the people that Wild Bill was working for were about as Nazi as Goebbels. So if he wanted to understand Nazism... He should look at the people who were signing his paychecks. That is just garbage. But it does beg the question of why. Uh, why is a forerunner, why is a spy from the forerunner of the CIA bringing over the Frankfurt School to the United States? Uh, I don't know. I can guarantee it wasn't for a good reason, obviously. I speculate. It is part of the century-long build-out of the kind of technocratic managerial worldview that they've successfully implemented today. So it may, have, it may have contributed to it. It may have been something that they thought might contribute to it. But nevertheless, it's there. That's your actual conspiracy uh, in, of Marxists in American universities right there. And as with all these things, you dig a little bit deeper and you find the real bad guys. So, uh, yeah, you're welcome. Actual conspiracy theory. I guess, so we've looked at his, we've looked at the worldview, or I've sort of given my opinions on its dysfunction, and we've looked at the inevitable neo-Marxist conspiracy theory and which bits are kind of right and the majority bits which are wrong. And if I'm looking to sum him up, like, how do we sum up Jordan Peterson then? And I guess for that, we'll want to return to the, the minimum intervention thing. As you can probably tell, I'm not the biggest fan of his actual content. And whatever, that's fine. Like, d disagreements, intellectual disagreements or whatever is fine. I don't think he's, I don't think his worldview is dangerous or genocidal, obviously, or any of that crap. I just don't think it hangs together very well. It lacks a, co a coherence that I think is going to go uninterrogated because he thinks it is co coherent, right? Um, but in summing up, I want to put, and this is a pleasing loop backwards into the cosmology, I want to put something very Jungian to you, and it's this. When you're thinking about Jordan Peterson, 
Remember that Gotham always gets the hero it deserves. So in one sense, this is what passes for a philosopher at this point in the timeline, unless you think we're in an era where we're about to get another Socrates or something. And, you know, it didn't really work out well for Socrates in an actual philosophical age. But Gotham always gets the hero it deserves. So this is what happens in 2018. And you just go to shrug and go, yeah, actually, th this is what happens, right? But there is more. Um, and this is kind of utilitarian. Um, for all its problems. Utilitarian and pragmatic for all its problems. How many people does Jordan Peterson have to help before you're okay with where, say, yours and his ideologies differ? Because it's in the hundreds of thousands, right? So the archetypal manifestation of Jordan Peterson right now and I mean that in the kind of sense that the collective unconscious has thrown him up into our collective consciousnesses, um, has helped a lot of people. So, but he has some dumb ideas, right? Uh, and I think his eruption onto into collective consciousness is not an indication that millions of young Western men are about to turn into goose-stepping Nazis. I think is an indication of just how many people could stand to benefit from some basic psychological treatment. And this is why the episode is called Kingdom of the Blind, right? We're all so sick and so few of us have access to the mental health treatment that we probably need. And this seems to me, it's sort of water in the desert. This seems to me the best explanation for his, for Jordan Peterson's electrifying rise and and the depths of devotion expressed you know among his fans towards him right they were sick and he helped them and i don't think i think you want to wonder about whether or not you can shit on that at all have you done something similar to help so many people and really that's what i'm trying to balance out in my head so for instance i said I, the worldview is dysfunctional um, but he's helped a bunch of people. But on the third hand, I guess, um, I think, for instance, he probably is transphobic. Uh, although, I mean, I agree entirely with his position on those Canadian laws um, that started the whole thing off. Everyone plays the game where you say, well, what would you have done? And I would have, you know, if you were teaching at the same college, I would have been out there and processed with him and I would have gone straight back into class and used the pronouns, right? which is a position he subsequently said 18 months later. But if you've watched a few of the videos, he has said other things. So he's right about the laws, but I think he probably is transphobic, as just as an example. And yet he's helped a few hundred thousand people. Uh, and he definitely spends too much time, you know, associating with the scions of the alt-right. And my guess there is that he's shooting for some kind of Jungian harrowing of hell, right? Like, so if you know your kind of later biblical texts, that's when Jesus goes into hell and lifts up all the, um, the virtuous people that had died prior to him resurrecting so that he kind of swoops back in and, and cleans them back up. I do actually think he has a bit of a Jesus complex, but maybe he's not thinking of it exactly like that, but I, I do. Th I can only assume he's trying to lift these people out of alt rightedness, and I mean he claims it's working. Uh, perhaps what would be good would be to see like video de testimonials of of recovering alt right members. Um, I actually think that would help uh, if he's um, you know if anyone speaks to him, just say, well, if you're restoring all these people from alt right mania get them on your show and uh, and explain exactly <laughs> how that happened, right? Uh, anyway, whatever. Better him than us doing that kind of stuff. So 
I don't think his liberalism, Jungianism blend hangs together very well, and his conspiracy theory doesn't pass my surely by now expert nose, come on, uh, when it comes to these sort of things. But I do. There is some good in it. It doesn't mean you dismiss the whole uh, the whole worldview. For instance, here's, here's an excellent example. I really like his focus on aiming for the good, for instance. It's a... It's a perfectly serviceable classical philosophical argument. It's, it's actually, in many ways, a redescription of church father solves for the presence of good and evil in the universe, uh, with some Socratics thrown in for good measure or flavor, right? Uh, but I like that idea. It's actually, it's also a good yardstick or watchword, and this is one of the reasons I like it, I guess, for sigil target statements, right? Because, and for largely the same reasons, it's a provably better way of orienting around uncertainty or probability. So even if you're wrong with something, with a sigil target, you're heading in the, in the least worst direction. And that's kind of why it was, and that's the church father argument, right? So um, evil is the absence of good and you go towards the good, right? So I like that. Uh, it's not that there isn't everything good in there uh, or everything bad in there, rather. I mean, you can get that elsewhere without having to tidy your room, nevertheless. Uh, so that's it. So that's, I guess, my official position <laughs> um, on Jordan Peterson is that he currently gets a pass for the stuff I don't like, the transphobia, the inner authoritarianism, the sex negativity, currently gets a pass for that because of the possibly hundreds of thousands of lives he has materially improved. So, as I said, that's a utilitarian pragmatic argument that has many flaws, uh, and I'm cognizant of that. Uh, he's not a philosopher, he's a de nor is he a demagogue, rather. Um, as far as I can tell, the official position for me is he's a highly visible mental health professional, and like anyone else, probably has views that, uh, you know, I don't agree with. But there is a final, uh, how do I describe this? There's a final mystic component to, I guess, my conception of Jordan Peterson at this point in the timeline. And I don't just think he is something that, as I said, that the collective unconscious brought into our collective consciousness, uh, which is part of the Jungian model. Uh, there's a lot of analysis of the 20th century, for instance, from a Jungian perspective, where the Cold War is is seen as that, is seen as the, is the collective unconscious um, playing out different archetypes in national and international complexes. So I'm not saying anything too far off the Jungian reservation there. The next bit is, I think maybe the archetypes must always have their champion. And if that's him, again, this is we, we, Gotham gets the hero we deserve. If that's him, does that change your opinion of him? So the first champion, modern era champion, the first champion was obviously Jung. And then I put it to you that it went to Joseph Campbell. And then it was probably George Lucas. And presumably either around the time he sold Lucasfilm or possibly when the le these latest non-Lucas uh, Star Wars films came out, it jumped, for some reason, to a Canadian professor who sounds like Kermit the Frog. I don't know what's going on there either, I just work here. But think about from a championship of archetypes perspective, obviously Jung did, Joseph Campbell, absolutely, uh, roaring success with his many books, however... However problematic some of the universalism has become, nevertheless, millions of people around the world began to interact with myth in an archetypal fashion. George Lucas, um, famously Campbell said he was his best student, got that to, what, billions now, given how many people are, are on the earth, got a living version of the archetypal hero story into the minds or consciousnesses of billions. 
what Jordan Peterson's done, and this is kind of why it's very uh, rune soup uh, specific contention, that he is the current champion of the archetypes, is obviously a few million more people who frankly need it um, are aware of Jung in general. But even better, to my mind, a good chunk of them are aware of the Red Book and how it was made, which is to say, magically. And in terms of kick-starting the process to make a few million more magicians, well, that's pretty good. That is pretty good soil preparation. And, uh, I mean, what have any of us done in that regard as well? So we'll have to wait and see if he is the archetype's current champion. And part of that will be when... So for backstory, the Red Book is how you jailbreak and individualize... Jungian conceptions of the world, as far as I can tell. So how many people are aware of that or doing it? And that, and, and we'll see if that, they in fact follow up with it as to whether or not this final piece of a, the official Jordan Peterson position uh, is uh, whether it holds up. I don't know. So that's it. Those are my thoughts on the wider significance, I guess, of Jordan Peterson. It got so we couldn't not talk about it or him. Uh, but for me, hopefully, this is probably one and done. And I hope there's enough to, I don't know, enrage any of the diehard fans out there that are listening uh, or enrage those who are expecting this to be a complete hit job. There are enough, as far as I am concerned, genuine villains in the world that need hit jobs, uh, rather than painting someone, rather than painting a mental health professional with all the things that you are scared of. Uh, and I guess reality is is always messier than that. So, flawed mental health professional. Well. Not a flawed mental health professional. Uh, highly visible mental health professional with some good parts in a belief system that I don't think is coherent um, or as coherent as it could be. Helped a bunch of people, which at the moment, from a pragmatic perspective, is valuable when comparing the things he's saying with the things he's doing. So that's it. Reality. It, uh, it's always messier than the, than the yes or the no, right? So anyway, I've no doubt I'll hear what some of you think, especially on YouTube. Uh, and it's always appreciated, not on YouTube. Um, and yeah. Until next time.